Amen. Good morning. Man, you guys look awesome. So glad you're here today. And, and I was out there earlier checking out all those animals and the little kids were having the time of their lives. And if you haven't been able to get your kid out there yet, make sure you go by and, and uh, see that petting zoo. Lots of, lots of good things going on. Busy weekend, a lot happening around here. We had a great Easter. Wasn't that awesome last week? Had a great Easter. We had about 800 people that were here in the building last Sunday. Isn't that awesome? And yeah, we're so thankful for that. And a whole lot more than that that were joining us online. And I'm so glad that you're back today. Whether you're here in the house back in Unplugged, maybe you're watching online this morning. Uh, I'm just glad that you took some time out of your Sunday to come and connect with people who love you and, and people who love Jesus. Those are my two favorite kinds of people, right? People who love me and people who love Jesus. And, and I know that there's a lot of people here like that this morning. Had a great day yesterday. I went axe throwing with um, the men's group here at Family Church. And I learned, uh, where's Marianne? I learned not to make Jesse mad at me ever because because that guy can throw axes. My goodness. He was on my team and we won because he was awesome. And so what a fun day. What a fun day we had. What a fun morning. I know our kids are having out there with all those animals. And man, we have connected with God already powerfully during worship. That was some great worship. And now we're getting ready to connect with God's word and it will change your life. If you have your Bible this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 18. And we're going to be hanging out there in just a few minutes. And I'm so excited today. I'm, I'm always excited on Sunday, but but I'm really excited today because I'm starting a brand new series. And the title of our series is Love the One in Front of You. Love the One in Front of You. And this new series kind of snuck up on me. I have another teaching called Secrets to Victory that I've had ready since last fall. And that's a series on the book of Joshua. I'm really excited about that. Joshua is my favorite Bible character. He was not only an anointed pastor, he was also... Uh, a brilliant military uh, genius. And there's so many good things in Joshua that we're going to be bringing out later this year. And I really thought that I would be starting that today. However, something began to stir in my heart a few weeks back while I was reading a book by Kyle Eidelman on the importance of changing the world. And it just so happened that the same week that I was reading that book, we had a guy here uh, from The Send on Wednesday night. How many of you were here? It was so awesome. The Send is happening at Arrowhead Stadium next month, and we have about 120 people from our church that are going up for that, and I'm so looking forward to it. But during that week, he was here, and he was also talking about, about how to change the world. And so I became obsessed with this idea of how you can change your world and how I can change my world and how family church can change the world. And it was all I could think about. And so out of that kind of came this series and I'm so excited about it um, for several reasons. But, but first of all, I just wanna bring the point back to family church. We're not here to just have good church services. Even though I think ours are some of the very best right? But we are here to help people find and follow Jesus. And if we have good church services, that's just a bonus that comes out of that. And I made a few little notes here about, about this, this idea of finding and following Jesus. I want, I want your kids to find and follow Jesus. Even the kids yet to be born here at Family Church. I want those kids to find and follow Jesus. I want your neighbors to find and follow Jesus. I want the people that you don't like to find and follow Jesus. I want those who don't think like me to find and follow Jesus. I want those who don't look like me to find and follow Jesus. I want those who don't share my moral values to find and follow Jesus. And you know what? That's a stretch for most churches. For that to happen like Jesus, we have to be willing to let people belong here before they believe. That's tough, right? Yeah, that's hard. 
We have to be willing. Everyone's always excited about that. You're like, yeah, we have to be willing to let people belong before they believe until two dudes come in holding hands. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> James and I are the exception to that rule, but, you know, we, <laughs> listen, we want, we want people who are not like us to find Jesus and then begin to follow him Amen. and let him change their lives because he can do that. Only he can do that. And, and so I want people, I want people to find and, and follow Jesus and so in that moment of reading that book, and really what I'm going to do today is just kind of lay the groundwork for this series, but, but in the moment of reading that book and then thinking about what was taught here uh, through the message of the sinned, I was thinking about how we change our world. And I was reminded of two things that week. First, number one, I was reminded how years ago when I first began pastoring, I asked God what he needed from me so that I could be effective. And I remember at the time I was 22 years old and I felt very in, un, inferior and I felt very unqualified. And so when I asked God that question, Lord, what do you need from me so that I can be effective? I heard seven words. I heard God speak seven words to me. And God said to me, love the one in front of you. And that's the title of this series. God said to me, Love the one in front of you. And so that became my personal mission statement. If God put someone in front of me, whether that was a friend, whether that was a foe, whether that was a, a family member, my job was to love them. And you know what? If I'm being honest, I haven't always lived up to that. Sometimes that's hard, right? Sometimes that's hard to love the person that God has put in front of you. And yet, that is what God spoke to me all those years ago. He said, Larry, I need you to love the one in front of you. And then second, I was reminded how important one person is to Jesus. And I want to read in Matthew chapter 18 and verse uh, 12 through 13 will be our text and actually the theme verses for this entire series. I was reminded how important one person is to Jesus. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 12 says this, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hill and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about the one than about the 99 that did not wander off. And if you look at those verses, three different times Jesus talks about pulling away from the group to go find that one person that needed him. He said, I'm going to leave the 99 that I have, and I'm going to go out, and I'm going to find that one person that, that, that needs me most. And so let's bring this point back to Jesus. Jesus is the person who made the biggest difference in all of history, but on paper, it didn't add up. Think about the life of Jesus. He grew up poor. He worked as an everyday laborer in a carpenter shop. He never went to college. He never traveled farther than he could walk. No one was following him on Instagram. He came from a blended family. He wore the robe of a wealthy man, but according to the Bible, he was homeless. And so how did Jesus make such a huge difference? If he's the man that made the most difference of any person on the earth, how did he do that? I'll tell you how he did that. Jesus practiced loving the one in front of him. Jesus made a difference one person at a time. One person at a time. He did what God was trying to tell me to do all those years ago. Jesus was so skilled at just loving the person that was in front of him. And if Jesus did that and he was able to make such a difference, then that is also what God has called us to do. Here's what I've come to conclude. Jesus led from the table, not the stage. Jesus led from the table, not the stage. And yet that's completely the opposite model that most churches have. Jesus led from the table, not the stage. He preferred to hold a cup of coffee rather than hold a microphone. I love that about Jesus. That was, that was his personality. And so I'm going to do my best to teach you for the next few weeks how to lead without being loud, how to love by listening, 
and most importantly, how to reach people with the message of the gospel without being rude, reactive, or religious. And that's a tall order, but I think that we can get this done. And so if you have someone in your life that you're trying to teach, if you have someone in your life that you're trying to reach, if you have someone in your life that you're trying to love, maybe you're having a hard time doing any of those three things, this series is going to really make a difference for you. It's going to make a difference for you. Because if you want to make a difference like Jesus, you have to focus on the things that Jesus focused on. And this is what God has been speaking to me lately, okay? Here's what God's been speaking to me lately. The secret way of Jesus was to engage people one at a time. Engage people one at a time. And there are many stories that we're going to jump into. So let's go ahead and jump in. How how do you love the person in front of you? How do we love the one in front of us? Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a neighbor, could be a friend, could be the cashier at Walmart or the waiter where you go and eat lunch this afternoon. Maybe it's an acquaintance. Maybe it's someone that you kind of find irritating or even someone that you don't get along with at all. Now, we all have those people in our lives, don't we? So how do we love them? In week three, we're going to talk about how some people are just easier to love than others. Um, And that's, you know, it's easy to love those people. But what about those people that are hard to love? We all have those people in our lives that are hard to love. And so we need to know how to do this. Number one, number one, Jesus always kept others in focus. Focus means this. It means the center of interest or the focal point. The center of interest or the focal point. And as you read the Gospels, there's a reoccurring pattern that I began to notice as I was putting this teaching together. When someone stood in front of Jesus, time stopped. The only thing that mattered to him was the person that was standing in front of him. And I'll go ahead and make a confession. I've been really convicted lately because even if I'm having a conv- uh, like a, 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 a casual conversation with someone and I get a text message, I'll look down at my phone or worse yet, I'll answer the text message. Anyone else guilty of that? I see those heads nodding out there, Right? But when someone stood in front of Jesus, time stopped. When we focus on something else, we're taking the person in front of us out of focus. And that is something that Jesus would never do. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 8. We're going to jump into a Bible story this morning. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus is out on ministry tour. And look what it says in Luke chapter 8 and verse 4. It says, massive crowds gathered from many towns to hear him. And so by this point in Jesus' ministry, everywhere he went, people were there. I'm thinking that maybe he had something good to say. Everywhere he went, people were there. And then the story continues, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 43. It says, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. And when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out of me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all of the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And there's so much going on here in that story, but, but I just want to kind of jump back into a couple of details. Yes, there was a massive crowd there that day, but that was not what Jesus focused on. The only number that mattered to Jesus was the number one. Was the number one, and we just read her story. Anytime Jesus was surrounded by crowds, he was always zooming in and focusing on one. And that's going to be So important, guys, that you get that in your heart over the next few weeks. It didn't matter the size of the crowd or or the number of people that were around him. Jesus was always focusing in 
and, and, and finding that one. And here's the lesson. To be like Jesus is to be able to look at your crowd and find that one person who is hurting. And sometimes that's a crowd of your own children. Sometimes that's a crowd of people that you work with. Sometimes that's a crowd of, of Christians who are huddled in the church lobby. And I appreciate this so much about Jesus. Jesus could find those in the crowd who felt crushed. And so when Jesus showed up, Jesus wasn't looking for the life of the party. He was looking for those who felt like that the life had been crushed and drained out of them. Which is just the opposite of what most people do. Most people look for the up and comers. But Jesus was always looking for the down and outers so that he could help them become up and comers. That's what he did. He would just walk into a room and he could find that one person that was struggling. Man, I wish that I had um, that kind of spiritual perception, don't you? Where you could just walk into your job and you could identify that one person who's struggling and hurting and needing some answers. Well, we, we, we can learn to do that and we'll get there. But first, let's, let's, let's lay a little more groundwork this morning. Jesus could find those who felt crushed. He could find those who felt hopeless. He could find those who needed answers right now. And one of the first ways that he did that, and this is our second point this morning, number two, Jesus didn't allow anyone to go unnoticed. Jesus didn't allow anyone to go unnoticed. Look at verse 47. Verse 47, Luke chapter 8 and verse 47, it says, Then the woman, seeing that she could not go what? Unnoticed. I love that about Jesus. It says, seeing that she could not go unnoticed. There was a gigantic crowd, but Jesus would not let her go unnoticed. There are a lot of people out there who feel like that if they disappeared, nobody would notice. I bet you that woman felt that way. Maybe you feel that way this morning. Maybe you feel like that if you disappeared, nobody would notice. Nobody would care. That it wouldn't matter. And yet here in the story, it says that, that Jesus would not let her go unnoticed. He, no, he noticed her. He noticed her. And as, as followers of Jesus, we are called to make sure that no one goes unnoticed. There's several ways that you can do that. If you see someone here at Family Church that you've never noticed, make sure you go over and notice them. Now, don't be creepy. <laughs> but go over and notice them. You're like, I've never noticed that person before. Don't let that person leave here unnoticed. If you see someone at your job or uh, maybe even in your, uh, in your family that's struggling, don't let that person go unnoticed. That's one of the, the traits of Jesus. He refused to let anyone come into his life that he didn't notice. And for some of you, that's going to be a little bit hard because your personality bend may be that you don't really put yourself out there a little bit. But aren't you thankful that Jesus always put himself out there and that he would never let anyone come into his life that he didn't notice? And so if God has put someone in your life, it's your job to notice them. Last night, I may or may not have gotten a Reese's Blast from Sonic. <laughs> may or may not. But the girl who brought my Reese's Blast, I gave her $20, and I said, you can keep the rest. And she said, oh, my goodness, I, I, can't, I can't believe that you would do that. And I said... Jesus, Jesus notices you. And I thought, I thought, you know what, Lord, here's what I said when I left away. I said, Lord, if you'll give me $20, I'll tip, I'll tip every server $20 <laughs> from now until you come back and tell them that you notice them. When God brings someone in your life who feels like they're unnoticed, like the woman in this story, it's your job to notice them. You know what? You probably have kids that feel like you don't notice them. 
We get busy with jobs and work and all of our adult responsibilities and everything that we have going on. And yet we have people who live with us that feel like sometimes we don't even notice them. To be like Jesus means that you, you never let anyone come into your life that you don't notice. Jesus loves every single person in the crowd, but the way that he loved them was one at a time. And you can love all your kids, right? But you have to learn to love them one at a time. And you can love all of your friends, but you have to learn to love them one at a time. You can love the people at your job, but like Jesus, you have to learn to love them one at a time. Jesus never, never let anyone leave his life unnoticed. And so that's, that's, a, that's a tall order, but I believe you can do it. Let's, let's go a little bit further. Jesus was constantly zooming in on one person. Let me give you some examples. Jesus goes to Jericho. And the people pack the sides of the street. It kind of looks like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. They're all there just to get a glimpse of him. And yet Jesus focuses on one person, a guy named Zacchaeus. He's a wealthy guy. It would be like a guy in an Armani suit in the top of a tree (laughs) trying to get a glimpse of Jesus. And to top it off, you know, the scripture, you know, just adds insult to injury by pointing out the fact that he was short, right? I like to tell people I'm the same height as Tom Cruise. I don't know why I like to tell people that. I just like to. So he zooms in. There's thousands of people. And what does he do? He zooms in on one guy and he says, Zacchaeus, I need to go to your house. He invited himself over. And Zacchaeus was like, okay. Jesus comes down the mountainside in Matthew chapter 8, and it says that large crowds followed him. What does Jesus do? He zooms in on one leper, and then he crops everyone else out of the picture. One leper. Here's another example. Jesus goes to a place in John chapter 5 where the scripture says there's a great number. We don't know how many, but there's a great number of disabled people. And look what it says in John chapter 5 and verse 5. It says, look at at the first word. John chapter 5 and verse 5, it says one who was there. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, And learned that he had been in that condition for a long time. He asked him, do you want to get well? One. One was there. And that one got Jesus' attention. I don't know why Jesus didn't heal all of them. But I do know that one is the way of Jesus. When someone stood in front of Jesus, time stopped. Everything else in his life, all of his concerns, his agenda for the day, it all blurred and disappeared. Why? Because he made sure that he was fully present. He was always focusing on the one. And most people, you know, we kind of train our eyes um, so that we see what we're looking for. And I think that we forget that Jesus trained his eyes to walk into any room and see the one person who needed his words, needed his touch, and needed his presence. And so let me ask you this morning, what if there were a church full of people who began to practice the one-at-a-time way of Jesus? And what if that church full of people like Jesus trained themselves to recognize the one person in any room who needed to be reached out to? And what if that church were a family church? (laughs) Wouldn't that be awesome? And so Jesus was all about the one person. It didn't matter if it was the woman who, who had the issue of blood or if it was the rich man who was in the top of a sycamore tree or if it was the leper, or if it was the guy who had been in a bad condition for 38 years, Jesus was all about finding that one person and making a difference in that one person's life. Which brings us to the next point. Most of the miracles in the gospel began with the words Jesus saw. And I I, uh, I love that. 
Most of the miracles in the gospel began with the words, Jesus saw. I've read a lot of books on miracles, but I've never um, uh, read a chapter where it talks about how, how that they began with how Jesus saw. And I'm afraid in many cases, we've conditioned people to believe that, that, that miracles um, always start with prayer, uh, that miracles always start with fasting, that, that miracles always start by us rebuking the devil, um, or that miracles started by Jesus going to the temple. But the majority of miracles in the New Testament began by Jesus saw. Jesus saw. And, and there is sometimes this super spiritual vibe that people walk in that kind of makes me want to throw up in my mouth a little. Um, you know, we're, we're usually ready to pray. We're usually ready to rebuke. We're usually ready to declare something, but they don't have eyes to see what Jesus wants to do. And so most of the miracles in the Bible started with Jesus saw. Jesus saw. In fact, there are 40 times in the Gospels where we read Jesus saw. Jesus saw. Jesus seeing was the launching point for the most amazing stories of transformed lives. Jesus just saw the need and he showed up there. So if I want to be like Jesus... Not only do I have to be disciplined in my relationship with God, but I also have to be disciplined in my relationship with people and how I've trained myself to see them. Now, just stick with me for a minute because this is going to help. Let's go back to the woman who had the issue of blood that Jesus would not allow to go unnoticed. And one of the things that is really interesting to me is that Jesus called her daughter. So let's go back to that story. Imagine being this woman. She's been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She spent all of her money on cures that never helped. She had nothing. The religious laws of the time stated that her illness made her unclean. That meant in addition to dealing with this terrible sickness, she was not allowed to worship at the temple. She was ostracized from her community. She probably had people telling her that her sickness was punishment from God. Or worse yet, that God was trying to teach her something through the sickness. If she was married or had kids, she could not touch them or anything that they touched. She was most likely forced to leave her home. Her life was a nightmare. Now, imagine she's your daughter. What did Jesus call her? Daughter. Imagine she's your daughter. That is what Jesus saw. He saw a daughter. He saw a daughter. And we know that most people treat their kids differently than they treat other people, and rightfully so. When I die, you guys aren't getting anything from me but my sons will get it. Most people treat their kids differently and rightfully so. However, look at this story. What if like Jesus, you saw a daughter, not a disease? Man, that really wrecked me this week. Jesus saw broken people one daughter at a time, one son at a time. Now, let me get personal, kind of get in your business this morning. Is there someone in your life that you see as a disease and not a daughter? Everybody in her story saw a disease. But Jesus called her daughter. Isn't that awesome? Man, I got some work to do. How about you? <laughs> right? Everybody saw a disease. Jesus, Jesus saw a daughter. And sometimes we have people in our lives that we see as a disease. And we don't see them as a son. We don't see them as a daughter. And so one at a time living changed the way that Jesus cared for and, and connected with people. And, and you know what? It will, it will radically make um, you shift your life. 
and how you interact with people when you learn the one-at-a-time way of Jesus. And there's so many. The New Testament is so full of stories, and we're going to go through a bunch of those over the next few weeks about how Jesus engaged people one at a time and how he made a difference in people's lives one at a time and how that God is calling you and how that God is calling us to make a difference for people one at a time. I made a few little notes here this morning that, that are just kind of things that are in my heart. Here at Family Church, we aren't going to be focused on how many hundreds of people are here on Sunday or how many thousands of people are watching online like Jesus, we need to zoom in and focus on people one at a time. One at a time. That was the way of Jesus. That should be the way of family church. We aren't going to make decisions based upon the crowd, but rather on the one. I was thinking about how, you know, and I've even been guilty of this. Sometimes in the past we say, you know, here, here at, you know, just in, in church life, we say, if we can't do it for everyone, we won't do it for anyone. And that might work for the government, but that does not reflect the gospel. And so at Family Church, we will do for the one what we wish that we could do for everyone, because that's what Jesus did. Jesus would focus on the one, and he would put himself in that situation. So how does this start this morning? Well, I think the journey just starts with a simple prayer. So simple. Jesus, give me your eyes for the one. Help me to see people the way that you see people. And you know what? I'm, I'm guessing that some of you already maybe have that one in your, in your mind this morning. Or someone in your life that, that maybe you have allowed to go unnoticed. Maybe someone in your life that, that you see as a disease and not a daughter. Maybe someone in your life who you know is hurting and yet no one has been Jesus to them. And yet God is calling you to reach out to that person. One, one was the way of Jesus and one should be the way that we live as well. All right, we're gonna stop right there. I'm gonna ask you to stand this morning. I'm gonna ask the musicians to come back and, and we're gonna take just a couple minutes here and have some ministry time today. Um, but first let's pray. Lord, I thank you, God, this morning that, that we can trust you, number one. Lord, that you are, uh, the scripture says that you are a very present help in time of trouble, and we know that that is true. And so today, as we think about the one-at-a-time way of Jesus and how that, that Jesus was so skilled at zooming in on that one person, he could see that one person in every crowd who was hurting. He could see that one person in every crowd who um, was going through a difficult season, and he would always take every opportunity to put himself in front of that person. And Lord, by doing that, those encounters resulted in miracles. Sometimes it was a miracle of salvation. Sometimes it was a miracle of healing. Sometimes, um, as we're going to see in the weeks coming, it was a miracle of deliverance or just so many things that, that were always happening when Jesus put someone in front of him. And now, Lord, we are here, his followers, and, and the spirit of Jesus lives in us. And so in the same way that Jesus refused to allow people to go unnoticed, Lord, that, that responsibility has shifted to us right now. And so first of all, I just pray, God, that you're speaking to the hearts of people. And maybe, maybe, maybe that point really hit hard when we were talking about having people close to you that feel like that you don't notice them. Maybe it's one, maybe it's a child that lives in, in your home and, 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 and that child feels unnoticed. They, they feel like if they disappeared, no one would care. Lord, I pray that you would give these parents and these grandparents eyes to see that, that need. And that like Jesus, they would uh, put themselves in a place to contribute to healing, um, he refused to let her go unnoticed. And we have to be that same way. And so Lord, today, I, I just pray, God, that, that that would be the cry of our hearts, that um, no one would leave our lives and feel like that, that we didn't care or that we didn't notice the pain that they were experiencing. And Lord, I also pray this morning, maybe, Lord, maybe there's some here today and, and um, like the crowd, they, 
they saw the disease, they didn't see the daughter. And, you know, sometimes people who are draining, sometimes people are difficult, sometimes people are different from us and it can cause us to put space between us and them or even assign them a name um, that is not their true identity, but we, that's the way that we see them. And so God, my prayer this morning is that you'll just break that off. And Lord, that we would have the heart that Jesus had, that this woman, she had been this way for a long time. She had been this way for 12 years and, and she was not, it, nothing was changing, not, nothing was shifting, nothing was getting better. And people knew her by her disease. And so Lord, I, I pray God that you would just break that off today and that we could see people like you see people. Jesus, you saw a daughter, you see a son, you see what's right, you don't see what's wrong. And, and Lord, we need eyes like that. We need to be able to see like you see so that we can help people like you helped people. And I know my prayer this week, the cry of my heart this week has, has just been, Lord, help me. Help me to learn the one at a time ways of Jesus. Help me to um, understand that it wasn't about the crowd, it was, it was about that one person in the crowd that Jesus went there for. And as we do that, God, then I know that, that, that supernatural things are gonna begin to happen. And, 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 and then lastly, Lord, I pray, I pray for Family Church and we wanna be a church that reflects the heart of Jesus. And I'm, I'm thankful and I'm grateful that we have people here um, that, that, are, that, are, that are serving and, and, and people here who are just the best people. And, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of that. But I also pray, Lord, that you will help us to learn the one at a time way of Jesus, that, that our responsibility isn't just to have good church, even though we have good church, but our responsibility is to help people find and follow Jesus. And sometimes that means um, dealing with people who are different than us, who are difficult, who are draining. Um, Lord, sometimes that's not always easy, but we know that you can help us to do this. That's why we're still here. That's what Jesus left us here to do, is to, help, is to help people find him and follow him. And that should always be the cry of our heart and the center of everything that we do here. Um, it should be to help people find Jesus. And so I just pray that today. And I'm so thankful, Lord, uh, God, for all that you're doing and all that you're gonna continue to do. And we just, we just give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. You can look this way this morning. I'm gonna ask the prayer team to come forward and, and you know, just a couple of things. Number one, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, we want you to know him. We want you to find him this morning and we want you to follow him, right? Um, not just find him, but follow him. Um, there's a lot that goes on in the following part and we can help you with that later. But right now it's the finding part, just finding him and, and coming to him and saying, you know what, Jesus, I need you to forgive me of my sins. I need you to um, make me ready for heaven. And he will do that. He loves you so much. He will do that uh, in your life. And so the, the altars are always open for that. And, and if not, we're just gonna sing this last song. Maybe you're here today and you need prayer. Maybe you're going through some things in your life and um, you, need, you need God to partner with you and he will. And we have people here who will partner with you this morning as well and join faith with your faith and they'll believe God for supernatural things to happen in your life. And if not, we're just gonna spend some time worshiping today before we go.